Thank you, mate. Uh, guys, what, can you hear me okay? That's all good. We'll start a little bit formal, but we'll uh, obviously get into it. There's plenty to talk about. There's lots of the news at the moment, so I'm sure you guys have got lots of questions later on. Okay, hello and welcome to Lunch with Lee. I'm your host, Shane Lee. Today on the show, a former Australian rugby league player and coach, Paul Langmack, playing 314 games for the Canterbury Bulldogs in Western Suburbs. He's a three-time Premiership player, winning in 1984, 1985 and 1988 with the Canterbury Bulldogs. Post-career, he's been involved in the media and he's become a gay icon, organising the first NRL gay and lesbian Mardi Gras float. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, great intro. Mate. One of your best, Shane. That's all right, mate. And Greg Matthews, a former New South Wales and Australian cricketer, playing 33 tests for Australia, 190 first-class matches in total. He scored four test hundreds and was the greatest finger spinner that I actually ever played with. Um, he took 10 wickets in the tied test. He's a media personality, he's an entrepreneur and one of the founding members of the Australian Cricketers Association and I call him the king of everything. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Mo? Boy, I, I didn't think you liked me. <laughs> like, that was the biggest intro I've ever had in my life. <laughs> Jesus, Paul, let's leave while we're on top of Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Now, Mo, as I said, you're involved with the Australian Cricket Association, which is effectively our players' union. Um, the IPL now, it's currently halted. Um, we've got 38 cricketers stranded. Brett's one of my brothers, one of them, over overseas. Um, pretty tough times over in India. Yeah, well, you, you wouldn't want to be there, but you went of your own free will. It's not as if it was a, an Australian tour, so people have to take responsibility for their personal decisions, and you'd be probably more aware than most with uh, the ACA because Brett is over there, you'd be aware that the ACA and Cricket Australia are constantly in touch with the guys trying to work out the best way to get them home. And, and maybe you can tell us what, what it's like for Brett over there. Well, it's really tough now because the players um, had the sort of biosecurity when the IPL was in operation. What they're really worried about now is that the, even the hotel staff who are coming and going every day and not getting tested, it's real trouble. Then you've got Michael Slater teeing off from the Maldives and I, I feel like saying to Slats, mate, the Maldives is a very dangerous place too. I, I know a guy once who lost his eye when a, a, a cocktail umbrella flew, flew out of his martini. So just watch yourself over there, Slats. It's you, been you, brutal. Brutal, mate. Have you found that surprising, Paul, from the outside looking in? You know, blood, saying our PM has blood on his hands. <laughs> well, coming from a rugby league background, um, I'm quite astonished, actually, that they're over there earning a lot of money. And uh, he's like a little spoiled brat. I know I've met him a few times, but, you know, there's people doing it tough here in Australia. And um, he d made the decision to go over there to make money. Mm. And good luck to him. You know, he was a great cricketer. But um, I think he should keep his mouth shut. I think so, too. I don't think our PM should be sort of delving into the, 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 the trenches with Slats and trying to explain himself. I think, um, as you said, the, the cricketers knew what they were doing. Um, they can't make an exception for cricketers to come back because... Look at us, we're having a nice lunch here at Eight Dining in, in St Leonard's and um, enjoying that because the government's done a great job here. Now, Paul, quick question. Um, well, not question. Um, real sad news with the passing of, of, of uh, Tommy Radonikus, mate. And you, he was one of your coaches for many years. Yeah, he certainly was. Uh, um, taught me more about life than football. Uh, treat everyone the same, whether they've got a dollar or a million dollars in mm -hmm. their pocket. And... Um, it was, oh, I was very fortunate. Um, like, I played at the, the Canary Banks Town, and in my first six years, I played in four first grade grand finals straight out of school. And I thought, when you're young, you think, wow, this is good. I want to win five more. Easy game. Yeah. And um, <laughs> in 1988, when we won our, when I won my third grand final, I was 23 years of age at the time, and was standing on the field. That's when um, we played Balmain, and Ellery Hanley knocked himself out. Um, <laughs> Someone was parallel with the ground, I think. Yeah, no, he knocked himself out. In he, read in the, he read in the Terry Lamb's forearm. But um, <laughs> I remember saying to Peter Moore after the game, and I was fed ink about it, I want to win five more uh, grand finals. I was 23, and uh, he said, son, you don't know how lucky you are. And I went to West for eight years and never played in a grand final ever again. But mm. um, Is that because you got greedy for the coin? or No, it was just a, a stage in life. I, I ended up... Um, partnering up with Jack Cowan and, boy, and running uh, Hungry Jacks while I was playing at yep. Lemire out of Campbelltown. I thought that was a good step for uh, afterlife of football. Um, I went to Canary Bankstown. I grew up in uh, Parramatta. I was a Parramatta junior. 
and I went to Canterbury because they offered scholarships, and I did a degree in uh, Bachelor of Business in Marketing. Well done. So that's why I went, one of the reasons I went to the Bulldogs was they uh, put you through uh, uni. Um, but going to West was com completely different. Um, at Canterbury, success was demanded. So it's sure the girls just arriving, I think, guys. The sound, yeah. <laughs> Happy days. <laughs> at Canterbury, success was uh, demanded. You went there to win. You trained hard and you trained real hard. We thought the opposition were trained as hard as us, but they didn't. We, we knew we were fitter than them. We knew we were tougher than them. And once you believe you belong somewhere, you excel. So when I went to West, it was completely different. Um, hadn't been in the semis for a long time. Well, uh, based out at Campbelltown. Uh, I went there because Warren Ryan, who coached Canterbury, coached West. He got us together with Gillespie and Andrew Farrell and a few other guys from Canterbury. And um, it went all right. And then he got sacked and they brought in Tom Radonikas. And it was probably a good time in my career when you're starting to get a bit older and the enthusiasm's there, but it's kind of not there. And then Tommy come along and he was a breath of fresh air. And for the first two years, you wanted to kill for him. Um, the game plan was very uh, scientific. It was bash the halfback and you win the game. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, we were watching, we were playing one day. We were at training and um, uh. we are doing a video session and um, Tommy's going through the Manly in the Illawarra game and he's going, watch Paul McGregor from Illawarra. He steps off his right, steps off his left. Watch Rod Wishart from Illawarra. And he went through about five Illawarra players. And then a bloke... <laughs> Brandon Pearson, who was playing in the centres for West, said, Tommy, you dickhead, we're playing manly, right? <laughs> and he said, oh, it doesn't matter, mate. You just bash the halfback. And we never watched the video ever again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it just proved that uh, if you have the desire and the passion and you work hard, you can get success. We're in a 20-team comp, supposed to run last. We ended up making the semis that year because we, we, uh, we loved it uh, playing for the coach. But, like... Um, after two years, it kind of got a bit repetitive. Like at half time, yeah, he'd, if you're getting beat, he'd say, You wouldn't beat me, grandmother, and she's dead, and I'll bash you after the game and all that. Like, did and he pull out an ox heart at any yeah, stage of the yeah, season? Yeah, yeah, he did that one too. He brought out an ox heart. Um, <laughs> he's not the, he wasn't the brightest fellow, but I love him, I loved him to death. He had a long sleeve white shirt on. Now, if you're going to bring a, uh, for a motivation talk before the boys run on, he had a plastic bag full of blood with an ox's heart in it. He reached down and pulled it out and the blood's dripping down his white sleeve and he, I thought, he's going to make us eat this. And um, <laughs> Bloody raw ox's heart. And then he threw it around everyone and said, take, feel that, that's what we need today, plenty of ticker. And we're playing North, North Sydney Oval. We're getting beat 20 nil at half time. And he come running in, he said, what's wrong? And I said, we're still thinking about the ox's heart. <laughs> and he went off his head, but we got beat 30-28. But uh, yeah, I, Great stories, great man. Can, can you talk to me about Cannery back there in the 80s? And I'm sorry, Shane, but no. we're just You're taking about. over here. Yeah, well, good. I'm just interested because what's going wrong there? Do you think the coach is to blame? Is Hasler the way he set up the, uh, the contracts? Um, they just don't seem to be playing with a lot of skill. Well, they just haven't got the players. Okay. It's like in business. If you haven't got the salespeople who are switched on, who, who are uh, craving for and desiring success and want to make money and, and do the best, if you haven't got it, you haven't got it. And it'll take them a couple of years to get over it. You can't buy premierships anymore. You've got to develop your own. Uh, you look at Melbourne Storm um, and the Roosters and now Penrith. They've got a lot of uh, young blokes who have come through their system. And everyone says, oh, the Roosters, they bought premierships. But... Boyd Cordner and uh, Jay Friend and guys like that, they were nobodies. They were kids when they went to the Roosters. Mm. Melbourne do the same thing and so did Penrith. So you can't buy a premiership. You need to buy young players on the way up and Canberra just haven't got the players. Like, it seems as though Melbourne develops tried and used players, seems to take them to another level. Does that mean that Bellamy's you know, your leading coach out there? Oh, for sure. Um, what he, um, It's their culture and it's a loose word used in, in sport, culture. Yeah. Like what is culture? It just happens. Clubs that talk about culture aren't successful. Nah. Culture is set by the, the senior people in a business or, or senior players. Um, and at Melbourne, they all train hard, they look after each other, they help each other. Um, and it's, you fit into a system. 
and you've you got a job to do. They give you three things to do every game, and that's what you have to do. And if you do it, you'll be playing next week. And they're so precise in what they do. Um, and when he first got there in Melbourne, uh, Craig Bellamy, any new player, didn't matter who you were, came to Melbourne, had to do two weeks of uh, a brickies labourer. Right. And work as a labourer, and their wages went to charity. Have they finished his house yet? No. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think that's great. So the rugby league players, because they live in a bubble, they go to school, and then they leave school, and they're straight away for uh, professional footballers. Mm. They don't know much about life in, in, uh, in that sense. But to go for two weeks as a Brickies labourer, I think it, it, they appreciate what it's like to be an NRL player. I'll tell you what, if, um, I know that uh, Canterbury have a, a massive Lebanese following and if Trent Barrett doesn't start winning soon, you're going to have to buy more than players. You're going to have to buy some new tyres for his car, I reckon. But, um, <laughs> so, Mo, I want to ask you about... Um, uh, we, we start off talking about India. Um, you spent a lot of time here. You took 10 wickets in a tie test. Mm. Um, I remember, I think... It was Tom Moody told me once that uh, you came onto the onto the bus. It was about forty eight degrees in Delhi, wherever you were, and you had a leather jacket on. And I said, "Mo, why are you wearing a leather jacket?" And he said, "It's the price you pay to look cool." <laughs> you, lo you loved in India, didn't you? I enjoyed <laughs> India because I, I say to all our listeners, there's nowhere in the world where every sense is assaulted for every hour of every day. It is an insane place. It's so extreme. The highs, the lows, the and it's, it's kind of like it, you're in a, a battle every day and if you lose that battle, then you're just going to lose the war. Mm. And it's a place that you have to embrace. Beautiful, wonderful people, very non-aggressive people that are desperately passionate about their cricket. It's, it's an extreme place. And the, my first tour there in 86 was also the monsoon season. So it, the weather was even more extreme, high humidity and, and intense heat. And, and how did you find it? Because I, I know... I've, been, I've probably been in India 50 or so times, and it's just so extreme, both on and off the field. Um, the most busiest place um, I reckon I've ever been to is uh, the team hotel, <laughs> an Australian cricket tour there. There's that many people trying to get a look at the players mm. and be part of it. They, they love the game. It's intense, isn't it? Yeah, certainly when you leave uh, the hotel for any reason, you're <laughs> just immediately <laughs> yeah. mobbed. Um, and they're just so passionate about it. it it's, and that's part of the beauty of it. It can wear you down. It can get big on you. But you just have to suck it up and, and be OK about it. Far yes, away. Paul. Can, um, I'd like to um, <laughs> bring to the point here that Mo used to play for Balmain in the SG Ball and was captain of Wayne Pearce's team. Is that true, Mo? You play with Wayne Pearce? Um, yeah, it was definitely Wayne Pearce's team. I certainly wasn't captain, uh, and that was... Gee, I think they were under 15, 16s back yep. then. And my first ever sporting event at the SCG was playing in the grand final for well. Balmain. We lost 12-8. Mick Coote, number four, was the 100-metre sprint under-16 champion of New South Wales. He got one on the chest at halfway with 30 seconds to go and he spilled it. <laughs> so my first experience with the SCG was playing rugby league. What position did you play? Uh, seven, halfback. Halfback. Well, what were you done to him? Bad. No, we were bashed. <laughs> <laughs> well, but getting onto that whole Tommy, <laughs> Tommy thing, I'm like, when back in the 70s, if you didn't get gouged, if you didn't get bit, if you didn't get kneed, if you didn't get stiff armed, you've had a quiet match. You know, it was just unbelievably brutal. I find it interesting people talk about Tommy. He was hard. That grand final he played when he saw Les Boyd coming at him and he, or a match at the, the SC, final. Was the final. Point. Yeah, and he saw him get through the ball <laughs> and got the first one in. And, and speaking to Tommy about it, is he, he said, well, he's going to get me, so I, I had to get one on him first. Mo, I, I want to ask you, because um, it, it's quite topical at the moment. Um, what pe a lot of people don't understand, the average length of any sporting career is only four years. Mm -hmm. That's across the world, across all sports. So you're lucky, I think, Mo, you played for... 15 or so, 16. Plus tax, yeah, yeah, plus tax, right? 20 years. Uh, he's still probably bowling off spin now. Uh, you, you had a great career. I had 17. 17 years, right? Yeah. Which is, that's exceptional. And, but a lot of guys only played for four years. Then have to deal with life after, after sport. And we're seeing, you know, Stuart McGill, a, a mate of ours who's, who's in the press this week, um, who's obviously struggling. It's really, really hard for some guys to come to terms with life after sport, isn't it? And it's one of the things the Australian Cricketers Association is is very, very mindful of. We have plenty of opportunities and, and through education and support to our members to make sure that when their, their career is coming around, I think Pat Cummings is a tremendous example of that. There's yeah. a superstar cricketer making 
I, I would imagine, tens of millions of dollars. He just bought a $10 million house at Bronick, so he's yeah. going to be making plenty to pay for that. And he did uh, a course through the association when he was out with his, his back injury and he wasn't playing to make sure that a business course, I think like you studied, Paul, you were talking about uh, business management and it stood him in good stead with uh, other things that he's doing outside of the game of cricket. So that if you can just imagine, it's, with a lot of sports guys, you just they fall off a cliff and I think it's very fair, I think it's very accurate to say as well, Paul, that that whole loyalty thing, you know, clubs, oh, yeah, got to be loyal, yeah, got to take up, yeah. hey, cut, yeah, yeah. got to, got to, got to. Whatever. And as yeah. soon as you fall off that cliff, yeah, you're gone. Mate, no one catches you. No, they don't. Well, I work in mental fitness for New South Wales Rugby League. Yep. And I go around to junior teams and talk before training with experts from um, the industry of uh, mental fitness and well-being. Mm. And it's so sad that there's kids committing suicide at the age of 15. Yep. Right? Um, and I have to deal with it all the time. But in professional football, because they go from um, school straight into not working, when they retire, they're forgotten about and they, they miss all the structure mm. and some of them fall off the wagon and get into trouble. Structure's it's, a big key. Yeah, and, yep. and there's no structure in their life anymore uh, where I think the NRL should form a, an alumni for mental fitness so that when you retire, mate, if you're ever in trouble, mm. ring this number and you ring in the past players and you just all talk to each other. Because, you know, it's like, man, when you retire, no one's patting you on the back anymore. No, no one wants to talk to you. And yeah. you're not Income training. loss. Yeah, yep. income loss. Uh, Status loss and lots of things. Now, look, I hope, I, was like, look, I hope Stuart is OK. We're all yeah. thinking of him. Um, but, uh, you know, I remember when his biggest issue was he couldn't get a, a cricket helmet to fit him because he's, he's got a head like a Swiss ball, Stu, right? And he's the only guy I know that his ears are wider than his shoulders, right? But <laughs> the poor guy, and but that was his biggest issue in his life. And he's obviously facing some really, really tough times now. So we, we hope he's OK, mate. But you're doing a great job. With no, but you, you've got a big head yourself, yeah, you right. know? <laughs> well, no, I've got no, a big, no big head too, you know? <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't have been able to play cricket. I wouldn't have been able to get a helmet big enough. But... Um, I hate it when I lose weight because my head looks bigger because <laughs> my body looks smaller, you know. But they, uh, I'm used to everyone commenting on the size of my uh, lemon spread, but that's all right. Now, speaking of big heads, you played under Bob Simpson quite a bit, didn't you? He, yeah, I'm like, here's, get your head around this, uh, everyone. He was coach of the Australian side. He was uh, a selector of the Australian side. And he managed me as well. Wow. Yeah. Were you in the team? I was up until... <laughs> <laughs> I was up until um, he left me as a manager. And uh, I was not selected for a World Cup in 1987 because of an, an incident uh, in Sharjah where we were playing right. in a one-day tournament. And that incident was very innocent. Someone, uh, he put his... I got the guy who was our liaison man to discuss with me, with this person that had made a supposed complaint. Absolutely water off a duck's back. Absolutely nothing went down. Um, I was fined $1,000, which... A lot a of money, of, yeah. It was a lot of money back then when you consider Dennis Lee kicked the bloke on national TV <laughs> during a cricket game. Yeah, I'm like, let's get, the, get it right here. And he got a grand as well, and yet... You know, I thought that was unfair, so I said I was going to appeal the fine. And, um, and Simpson put his right hand on my left knee in the lounge of the reception at this um, hotel that was shaped like a pyramid in Sharjah and said, quote, I'll give you my word, if you don't appeal the fine, it won't impede your chances of, of going on a World Cup. Well, I had, I'd just come off a, a fantastic series on a personal level in 1986, 87. My statistics were very, very, very strong. And um, I thought, well, if I take this, you know, it's just a power play by this bloke. And um, yeah, I, I, I went on a honeymoon. I got back from my honeymoon. He was the only person who knew I was wow. going on a honeymoon. And uh, a, one of his friends as a journalist rang me and said, how do you feel about not being selected in the uh, World Cup team? And, you know, you talk about falling off cliffs. That was just brutal. And um, I was just married and... You know, financially, yeah. I was, you know, it, it stung a lot, just the opportunity of playing in a World Cup. I'd had great stats. Particularly when you're in form too, you, you don't want to waste that form because it doesn't always come along that, that easily, does it? He was a harsh man. He was just, mm. 
I, I have zero respect for the guy and you know, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not talking about other people, but I don't know of anyone that is more disliked than him. Um, I'll ask you both the same question. I, I know how I feel about this. Do you think that with social media and, and the scrutiny now that the, our sports, both men and women, go through, do you think we, we all played in a, in, a, in a better era where you could go, as you said, I think you were quoted as saying, the Bulldogs, you, you played hard, you trained hard, you partied party hard, hard, you yeah. partied hard. Um, do you think that they're missing out on stuff these days? Of course, they're getting paid a little bit more, but there's a lot of scrutiny that goes with that. But the whole life has changed. Yeah, you, know, you look at um, you can't compare athletes or, or uh, from past yes. eras because the the grass is different. We used to play when there was hardly any grass, and the balls are different. Yep. Training's different. You can't um, compare eras. Um, we had a great time. We grew up in a great era where petrol was cheap. You talked to your neighbours, and everyone was happy. You left the car unlocked. You left yeah. your house unlocked. Mum said, "Be home for dinner." You'd run around the streets. It'd get dark. You'd head home. But see, I'm filthy now because. Um, if I was playing now, I'd have that much sponsorship because I'd go up to the referee because he's mic'd up and say, mate, you know I drive a Lexus and, uh, <laughs> mate, you know I eat at McDonald's. Yeah. They couldn't stop you. Can't wait and for, you'd be can't wait for much our money. beer tonight. <laughs> yeah. How about yeah. that Spartan Sports? How good are they? No, I'd go, I'd go uh, O'Brien's beer. It's beautiful, right? Yeah. Hey, right? And, you, yeah. and you, they couldn't stop you from doing it. You'd make more money in endorsements on TV than playing the game. You should be managing... I mean, I was fil I'm filthy. You should I'm filthy with my mum and dad. You should be managing people, mate. I, I, I understand the information you're saying. I make the, the freedom, perhaps, as, as you mentioned, uh, was greater in our day. Yep. Um, but I also think if we had senior players, uh, certainly when I was playing, that made sure that the youngsters stayed in line and knew what was right and wrong. I think mm. at New South Wales, there's that word, we had a very, very strong culture. Um, when I got into the team, we hadn't won in 17 years and we won five in the next eight, ten years, I think it was. So we had a great nucleus of old, young and respect for yourself, respect for each other, respect for the baggy blue cap. These days, I'd like to think, Shane, if you were coming through, if Paul was coming through, if I was coming through, that's what you grow up with. You know, you grow yeah. up with social media, so you adjust to you what, what's put in front of you. You know, you know that there's going to be everyone effectively is a policeman. Everyone effectively is a reporter. So if you have that information, if you are, are taught that information, then you learn to yeah. adjust to it. That's, that's Just like you, you adjust to the game. And that's a great thing that you say about eras. People say to me, wouldn't you love to play today? I would have loved to have played in the 20s. I would have loved to have played any time. Because I, I, I thought, you were, thought you, were, you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the way you look. But can oh, I ask no, you a question? But just what? the eras is interesting. When people talk about eras, it's like, by the way, I mean, a guy I think of that would have been a great T20 player that was a, a solid player at best for New South Wales was Trevor Bayless. Yeah. You yeah, know, reverse sweeping. He yep. developed a lot of things. He, he, was, he was the first guy to develop the coffin with wheels. I yeah. mean, funny he had a patent in that. Yeah. Like, God, we had to carry these bloody things. Yeah. But players from different eras would have been very successful in today's eras. And some of the guys that were successful in my era wouldn't have been successful in this era. It's a great comment about eras. You just can't compare them. Chalk, chalk uh, and cheese. I, I want to read a quote out, Paul, because um, I, I wasn't being tongue in cheek when I mentioned you being a, a, a gay icon. But what you've done for what you've done for equality in sport. And here's a quote: "It says Langmack is one." of the favourite people in footy. His nickname, Yesterday's Hero, is a reference to former segment on the footy show. But I call him the Collie Minogue of Rugby League. Because in the past, he's become a, a gay icon of sorts. It's better than calling him Madonna. But you, you, you've done a lot for, it doesn't matter what your background is. If you play sport, play the NRL, if you're gay, if you're from a, a homeless family, wh whatever it is, um, you deserve the right to be treated the same. Yeah, I agree. And uh, how it all come about was um, Stuart Ayres, the Minister of Sport at the time, uh, wanted to put together a float for the Mardi Gras for sport in general. And no one from the... I didn't know about it. And I work at New South Wales Rugby League. It works under the NRL, but we worked in the same building at Moore Park at the time. And no one at the NRL uh, wanted to be part of it. And I found out about it. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I wanna, I'll do it. And so I did it. And when I went on the, the float, and while I was there, I was talking to the guys there and girls. They said, oh, you should... Um, it was, it was um, a time I'll never forget. And they said, you should get your own float. And I said, yeah, next year I will. So um, I did it. Um, the NRL wouldn't give me any money, even though the NRL said it was their float. I had to go and raise money outside of 
uh, football people and we I ran the float for two or three years and then it became very, very popular. The NRL took it off me oh, okay. and then I said, oh, I won't do it anymore and then you do it. So that's how it came about. And I think I shared one of those with you. Maybe you even did the too. First. It was, it was a the very first fun. one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah was, um, Tomo, who was married to uh, Elise uh, yeah. Perry. Um, yep. We had a couple of netballers. Uh, S -swans. S Swans. It was across the board. It was, a, it was a super day. You were running around like a chook with your head chopped off. We had a ball. Happy days. Yeah. Well, I think it's great to pick, like kids now coming through. There's not those pressures, and you can only imagine what it'd be like for 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 a young guy playing rugby league, for instance. And you know, he's well, yeah, you know, Roberts own was the first be tough, person it? to come out, and he was one of the yeah. toughest to play the game. Yeah, yeah, but you know, but I want to ask you a question: Is that both years? Is that why is it that in the past I I could name players that played for Randwick, right? Yep. You know, uh, Lloydie Walker, all those guys, right? And then I knew the cricket's New South Wales, Dave Colley and all that, which was not on TV, right? Mm -hmm. we, which Channel 2 used to do the rugby union. So, yep. But now we have every game on. I couldn't tell you who plays for the Waratahs or plays for Randwick. Why is it so? Like, do you have that... It's been bastardised, hasn't it? Well, no, but, like, you just think, oh, it's on, so I don't watch it. At different eras, again, you grow up with people, you have relationships with those people and you follow those people. Uh, you become a parent, so you, um, you're preoccupied with other industry uh, as well, as far as the workplace mm. is concerned. You have different things to do, different groups that you're hanging out. You can call it, you know, progress, or you can call it just you're not interested anymore. I still have an interest. And when you, it's interesting you say rugby and not rugby league. But I don't know, rugby's pretty hard in the eye these days. It was a bit more enjoyable, I thought, back in my day. And I liked the idea of rucking, you know, mm. like uh, they were war wounds, those, they were warm medals on your back. And so I played a bit of. I played a bit of cricket with the Ellers, actually, which was a bit of a hoot, and I played a bit of rugby with them uh, as well for a couple of rep teams back in the day. So I had a great... I was very fortunate to play with some highly talented people, and, and it was, again, that era, just a different time. We, if you watch cricket these days, oh, my God, there's 16 test matches England are playing this year, and there's a World Cup, and there's a there's T20, so, so and there's, you know, Sheffield yeah. Shields being shunned out the back yeah. door. It's... It's terrifying the direction cricket is going. Well, um, the, one, the one sport that is in really good shape is AFL because they have a genuine off-season. And people, at the end of the season, it was like when we played cricket here, yep. the Feast of Cricket season, we had that two weeks where we all went to the races, <laughs> and then footy season would start. And you'd follow the AFL, the rugby, the rugby union, yep. then footy season would finish and you'd look forward to cricket. We don't get that anymore because it's on all the time. And multiple reasons for that, because it's, it's a business these days. It's yep. sport, it's, it's a business. It's a, a multi billion dollar industry cricket yeah. it's a tens of million billions of dollars cricket and at the risk of being a little bit controversial it's insane to me how the level of and quality of male female sport has really lifted and yet the administration yeah. and the governance of sport has really been slow to pick up the slack i mean like, league to me stands out like the proverbial dogs well what they're trying to do now is make it so even keel competitive but I think the rugby league now, their real changes has made the good players really good. Their footballers and the athletes are not so good anymore. So that's why there's this uh, disparity in performance and scores because the good teams are just too good for the uh, mm. also range. Like there's probably five three. teams, four teams, three, three, three. Melbourne, Penrith, and um, Craig Hodges here. You'll say the Roosters. South for sure. <laughs> are the only ones who can win the comp. I, I have All to the rest are gone. Concur with I'll you. I tell, right. tell you what. One of the beautiful moments I saw in sport last week, and it wasn't beautiful for Brett Morris, but seeing Brett Morris with his brother Josh Morris after he's done his ACL, probably career-ending, now in tears in the change room. And I know what sport and cricket meant to you, Mo. Mm. That's, that was hard to watch, I thought. Yeah, I'm like it just reminded me of my last game where I sat in uh, Newcastle Oval by myself with a yeah. bottle of bourbon and got smashed. <laughs> <laughs> Not a mate around me. You actually went by. Not a, did I have a brother hanging out I was off the cliff. Even my mate's like, you... And you were the reason why I got injured my career ended. Comes to, as a matter of fact, Shane Lee throws the ball at warm-ups um, uh, at Newcastle back in 98, at the end of yeah, 98. 98, yep. And uh, I, I thought, don't stop that with your foot. I stopped it with my foot, rolled my foot, busted it. And, and Brett, Brett made his debut. Yeah. <laughs> and w what a good deed that was for Australian cricket. One of three people only in the history of Australian cricket to do 300 test wickets, 380 wickets. Mm, yeah. Great player. Great player. But, um, but it, it did mean a lot, did it, to you? Like, uh, I remember sitting numerous times in the change room with having a cold beer in hand and talking about 
not only like life but sport. It meant a lot, didn't it? it was an O'Brien's beer too. <laughs> well, well, I was before, but it should have been O'Brien's beer. Look at that, Paul Langmack. Tui's had a bit of a, <coughs> a, a covered on the, the old uh, cricket in, back in those days. They were, they were with us for an extended period of time. But uh, I don't think they have a beer after the game these days. No, do they, they in league? No, some teams do. Okay. But they're a bit scared because of political correctness in the dressing room. With the cameras, cameras in there on. and all that, yeah, okay. like um, I don't. Th- I, I work with Gavin Badger, who used to retire from refereeing last year, mm. and I, t- I talk to him all the time, and I say referees shouldn't be mic'd up because they they can't be themselves. Like when I was playing, and uh, the referees would say, "Can you get on side? You make me look like a fool, right?" Well, if you say that now, you'd say, "Oh, it's corruption. He's he's on the take. He's betting." Mm. So they, because they're mic'd up and they want to bring every, everything into the lounge room, you're not getting the real fabric of the game mm. of of the way the game should be played mm. I think my, my wife wants to get mic'd up now around the house tell me tell me off too but um so we asked everyone the same question and i'll ask you i've asked Moe this question before uh, a young footballer coming through what advice would you give him or, or young girl coming through playing footy train hard yep get a career uh, also yep out of it whether you go to uni or study um uh, and just train hard because nothing comes easy and hard work doesn't hurt you. And, and Mo, you're working in the insurance game now, aren't you? I do. I do a bit of work with a, a company called Lockton, which I'm enjoying immensely. It's my life after cricket. Uh, we're in 125 countries around the world. I'm enjoying that immensely. I've just come on board to help out in the sports side of things, doing a bit of work with uh, well, Pat Cummins is one of our boys, a few cool. of the other IPL players. Um, and, yeah, we're looking to just build our sports business uh, here in Australia. But 125 countries, just looking down the East Coast, we have offices and... Brisbane, Sydney, uh, Melbourne, and also uh, over in Perth. And it's, it remi- Lockton Insurance reminds me so much of the Australian Cricket Association. It's, an, it's a hoot to be part of. In Australia, small, upwardly mobile. And my boss, Michael Woodlands, is just one of the Earth's great people. And it, it just reminds me of, that I'm back in with my brothers and sisters with the Australian Cricket Association. Mate, we'll put the details up on our website, mate. Yes, yes, Paul? You know what I like about O'Brien's, like up, O'Brien's <laughs> Premium Lager? <laughs> You know what I like about O'Brien's premium lager? Wait, well, Joey, Joey, it's gluten free. Joey Proctor's over here, so. It's gluten yeah. free. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> no, because I'm, the, gl- no, I'm in the gluten free products. Okay. There you go. I'm uh, intolerant of um, gluten intolerant, so I can drink this plentiful. Well, I can see some cases coming your Happy way. Happy days. Mate. Look, I want to thank you both for coming on the show. <laughs> you're, you're a genius. Uh, sponsorship's just gone through the roof, thanks to Paul Langmack. But um, I think we can all enjoy, enjoy our time now and have a, have a nice lunch here at 8 Dining uh, in St Leonard's, uh, Pacific Highway 372, I think it is. Check it out on the website. Um, and yeah, thanks guys for coming. Enjoy the lunch and thank you to you too. Thank you. For the stories and uh, I much appreciate it. Thanks, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.